High Court, praying the court to validate Speaker Bagbin's declaration of four seats vacant. Benjamin Yamutete wants the High Court to stop the four and were declared vacant by the Speaker from holding themselves as MPs until the case is determined. But that is not all. He also filed a separate suit preventing Speaker Bagbin from recalling the House. Let's get into the details of this, or as some people call it, the mess. Dennis Widam Poiberi has come through the two documents and joins us here with some details. Uh, Council. Uh, listen, it looks like Parliament's problems will not end anytime soon. What else is in this suit? Well, so the matters are becoming complicated as the days go by. Every turn, there are twists and turns every single time. Now, we are hearing of two pending suits against the Speaker of Parliament in one instance and in another against the Speaker of Parliament and four others. And these four others basically are the members of Parliament whose seats have been declared vacant for which reason we find ourselves in this situation of this parliamentary, um, um, I mean, situation. Yeah. Now, you recall that in the midst of the conversation, there were those who say that the appropriate forum for um, determination as to whether a seat is vacant or an MP has been validly elected mm -hmm. is the High Court. They make reference to Article 99 of the 1992 Constitution. So that's exactly what Benjamin Tete has done in this particular suit, to say that, look, there is... Uh, a question to be answered as to whether these MPs have vacated their seats or not, and by way of what had happened with the Speaker making that declaration. Mm -hmm. He is of the view that what the Speaker did is the right thing to do, but I'm bringing this to you for you to make that final decision for us to know if indeed they should continue to be in Parliament or they should right. vacate their seats. And that is what, that's the basis of this particular suit, where the Speaker is named as a defendant together with the MPs. For specific relief that he's seeking, that's a declaration that the Speaker's ruling on October 17, was in accordance with Article 97.1 G and H, and was therefore valid. Mm -hmm. He also makes the case that he wants an interlocutory injunction to restrain and prevent the embattled MPs from holding themselves out as MPs in the eighth Parliament, and also having access to the Chamber of Parliament until this uh, suit is determined. Right. He goes on to ask for a, uh, a perpetual injunction in that regard, and a lot more. In the other suit, where it is, where it's he names only the speaker as the defendant. In that instance, um, so in that particular suit, mm -hmm. what he's simply seeking to do is almost saying the same thing, but this right. time around, asking that a determination be made that what the speaker did on the 17th of October is the right position of the law, mm -hmm. and that those MPs, their seats should be deemed vacant, they should be restrained from parliament, they are, that their being in parliament would be an illegality or mm. an unlawful act. For that matter, the Speaker should be, direct, should be ordered to remove them from Parliament and stop them from coming into the House. Mm, I see. And then there's also a particular relief that uh, you know, he seeks about recalling the House? Yes. So in reference to that, he's also seeking that, you know, there are attempts for Parliament to be summoned. Mm -hmm. He says that considering what is happening now, Parliament should not be recalled until this suit and other matters regarding the legibility or otherwise of those MPs right. is determined finally. So that too is also on the table. And that's basically what, 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 what these suits and, are about. And, and that is just, uh, you know, hold it for me. Let me go on to the phone lines now and speak to Nick Paco Samwa Addo. Well, my understanding is Nick Paco is on Zoom. Uh, he's the lawyer for the plaintiff, Benjamin Teteyemo. Uh, Nick, good evening and thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Why does your clients deem it fit to take on this cause? Well, good evening to your... I hope you can hear me. Absolutely, Lenny. Okay, so good evening to your wonderful viewers and uh, listeners as well. Um, my law firm represents the, um, the plaintiffs in the two suits, even though I'm not the lawyer of the record. Um, but I still had the law firm, so right. I can speak to the matter in this speech. Now, the issue is this. If you recall, there's a certain aspect of the matter in the Supreme Court, which relatively deals with the interpretation and uh, or the challenge that the speaker has sought to interpret the provisions to do with the fact as to whether uh, by, by moving from a particular party which elected you or whose ticket you stood to file as an independent, 
you had therefore crossed carpet. And by necessary implication, you had vacated your seat. And so the speaker gave a ruling which the honorable, um, uh, well, if we still the majority leader, the Afenio Martin took to court and challenged that the speaker had aired by interpreting that provision and that that provision interpretation of the constitution was the sole preserve of the Supreme Court. So that technically deals with whether or not the speaker was wrong in assuming the jurisdiction that he did in, you know, making the ruling that he did, which, um, which in the opinion of the plaintiff in the Supreme Court amounted to an interpretation of the constitution. My client is in court with specific respect to the provisions of the constitution, which actually state explicitly that matters to do with the declaration of, or matters to do with whether or not a dispute has arisen as a result of a vacancy in the in parliament must be determined by the high court. So he has exercised his right as a citizen to say that, look, in his opinion, once the, the ruling that the speaker gave was a valid ruling. And so if it is a valid ruling, then technically those seats are, you know, vacant. And so he's seeking the declaration from the high court to confirm the speaker's ruling. And once that is upheld by the court, then we will be in line with the constitutional provision, which says that it is the high court that makes a determination I see. as to whether a seat is vacant or not. So we want to put the controversy, you understand, if there's any mm -hmm. beyond that, mm -hmm. so that we will be clear that once the constitution says that the forum for determining any dispute as to whether a seat is vacant or not is that of the high court, we say that, okay, what is going on in the Supreme Court is about whether or not the speaker rightly or wrongly, if, if it's right, then it means that he applied the provision. If he was wrong, it means that he interpreted the Constitution. That is the reason of the Supreme Court, to well. interpret and enforce the Constitution. In our case, we are in court, first and foremost, to have the, the High Court, which is the court under the Constitution, vested with jurisdiction to make declarations in respect of whether or not a seat is vacant for that court to exercise that jurisdiction. Secondly, we are saying that if the court agrees with the speaker, right, the high court agrees with the speaker's ruling, it means that the people who are affected, the four MPs who are affected, mm -hmm. are no longer members of parliament. Very well. And so they don't have any legal basis to partake in the proceeding of parliament. So if there should be a recall, that recall should exclude them. And so if there's a recall of parliament, there's the danger. And, they have, and if you look at until the controversy about these four people are determined by the court, they must not be allowed. And so Mr. I Speaker, see. hold your hand until me, me, I'm afraid the controversy is by Sorry, okay. Very well, right. I'm afraid we'll have to leave our conversation here. All right. But thank you okay. so much for, okay. uh, you know, putting yeah, some, welcome. yeah, explanation to uh, the, the suits that we've seen so far. I appreciate your, your time. Ni Pakbo Samoa Addo, he represents uh, Benjamin Tete Yemu, or his law firm represents Benjamin uh, Tete Yemu. Uh, who has now launched two new suits against Parliament and the four MPs in question. Now, I'll come back to this story in a bit because this, this really important subject I want us to look at this very minute because uh, what we are learning is that Ghanaian leaders could be deliberately looking the other way while his neighbours in West Africa are battered by insurgency. Ghana's near and far neighbours in the Sahel have all suffered extremist attacks. I'll tell you more right now. 
Indeed, let's take a look at this issue that has to do with extremist activities in West Africa. Ghana's near and far neighbors in the Sahel, as you well may be aware, have all suffered extremist attacks, killing hundreds of citizens, sometimes at a time. But Ghana's northern region has remained the lone spot of sanity in the Sahel, and some researchers say this could be as a result of what is described as a, quote, de facto non-aggression with JNIM or JNIM. And I want you to pay attention to those initials. The research also points to a high-ranking government source who, quote, acknowledges that Ghana serves as a supply line and recognizes that disrupting these networks could provoke violence. Uh, the threat of an attack, that government source says, is why we don't disturb them too much. Now, let me explain this. In a nutshell, Ghanaian authorities are intentionally not doing anything about this, essentially throwing our neighbors under the bus, and that's why our border security is lax, according to this paper. Now, what does it mean for Ghana to be a critical supply for extremist groups like Jama'at, Nusrat, Al-Islam, Wa Muslimin? You may have heard me before when I referred to them as by their initials, excuse me, Janem. Now, let me tell you. They talk about food, they talk about non-perishable supplies like dynamite, fuel, cattle, motorcycles, and then manpower, recruit. But then we also know that sometime in May 2024, uh, Ghana's ambassador to Burkina Faso had talked about some of them coming in to use our medical facilities. So now the question, is this the case that Ghana is purposely ignoring Islamist activities inland to prevent attacks or this could be Western propaganda to destabilize our country. I've got the man to help us unpack that. First joining us is Ghana's ambassador to Burkina Faso, Boniface, uh, 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 His Excellency Boniface Agambila. Uh, he's joined us via Zoom. Uh, Honorable, thank you so much for making time to speak to us. But Your Excellency, is this true that Ghana is turning a blind eye to the activities of Islamists here just so we will not be the subject of attacks? Uh, if it was true, by now Ghana would have been hot. Because if it was true, terrorists would be in Ghana by now. We, we agree that uh, criminals can be smarter than uh, innocent p uh, people. But we only need to strengthen security at our borders and in our homes. That's all the messages we've been given. Um, we said it was, there was a possibility that people could just sneak in and do things without anybody's knowledge. If somebody decides to cross our frontiers, go to a private clinic. He could get uh, with money, he gets treatment and he runs back. But that does not mean, or that is not to say, we have seen them and we know them. These terrorists, you will know them. You don't know them. And uh, Ghana cannot be adamant to things. Wherever that research is coming from is strange. Mm. Because Ghana has been, Ghana has taken a proactive role, a preventive role. You are in the media. You very clearly will remember the president of Ghana, President Nanado, initiated Accra Initiative. And you know more about the Accra Initiative. It was a group of countries bordering with Burkina to come together, mm. to strategize proactively, strategize preventively. I because see. logically, logically, the attacks or the incursion very relevant within the Sahel area. Mm. And Burkina Faso, is, Burkina Faso is between the coastal countries and the Sahel. Very well. So, 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 Your Excellency, uh, if, you, if you read this yes. uh, paper by uh, the Netherlands organization, 
it tells you or it comes to the conclusion that two things are true. That Ghana may be involved in the Accra Initiative and in fact, uh, you know, taking steps to ensure that extremist activities are, uh, you know, checked in, in the Sahel region. But at the same time, they cite a, a high-ranking government source who admits that, listen, we know they're coming to a country. This is a safe haven for us. A, a, you know, a, you know a, a, a group of words that you have used yourself before, that this appears to be a safe haven for, uh, you know, insurgents when they come to Ghana, for which reason this high-ranking government official says that we look the other way. Yes, in response to that question, it is that criminals may find that Ghana could be a, a safe heaven. It didn't say that it is a safe heaven. Okay, so the no, message must Your be Excellency, you were, you were quoted in the paper, and in the paper it says that you say the criminals consider this place a safe haven. Is it the case that we yeah, are aware of the activities here? But for our own peace, we look the other way? Why are you putting words in my mouth? I'm saying that the response to the media was that the criminals could find Ghana as a safe heaven. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean that they find it as a safe heaven. And I'm saying that. Those criminals, they are not at a place you know them. Ghana doesn't know them. Uh, other countries will not know them. They are unpredictable criminals. How they organize an attack, you cannot know. No country will know. Mm. The Burkina government has now advanced in capacity, in training, and in attacks. So you hear more about attacks, but the government of Burkina today is on top of its levels. Terrorists today fear Burkina. Mm. Territories they have, the territories they have hitherto taken control. I see. The government, the authorities are in control now of most of the areas. Areas that you couldn't go are now in, under control. Schools were closed. No, no children could go to school. Now children go to school. So all we're saying, looking at the, nature, the landmass, criminals can run to anywhere with your knowledge or without your knowledge. And mostly they will hide. So we are saying, when the Accra Initiative was created, it was created to be a preventive and a proactive institution to help the people of Burkina to Very combat well. terrorism. Indeed. So how can it be that I, Ghana has turned a blind eye? So if the objective of terrorists or this jihadist group is to conquer the world, and you think that when they conquer Burkina, which will be the next country? Logically, if they conquer Burkina, Ghana is in danger. So that is why Ghana has taken steps to strategize locations in Ghana and the other Very countries. Well, so, Your, Your Excellency, yeah, will, will, you then, will you then say that this paper and its content and its attribution that Ghana is deliberately allowing insurgent uh, you know, to use the country as a safe haven just so it is protected from attacks, Western propaganda? Would you consider it that? They, where are they from? I don't know them. And I haven't heard of them until this publication. Where are they coming from? Did they come through to see the grounds? Have they seen Ghana doing anything on it? Who knows them? I don't know them. Perhaps you do. And where do they get the information from? From research. Who did they talk to in the, as you claim, they claim a higher authority. Which higher authority? Of where? And who did they contact to get the information? 
these terrorists are unknown. You can you won't see them. How did they get to them? To know that they are in under control and they are getting uh, whatever it is. How? How does that happen? Is this Western propaganda and an attempt to destabilize our country? Maybe you see elections time, so many things can happen. Maybe some people are doing some propaganda due to our elections coming December 7. Or they're doing their propaganda with fake information, maybe from wherever they get their, they are able to uh, design this research, research that they didn't contact the right people. They didn't, con who did they contact to get the feedback? You know, so when you read it, Very well. so you read it, you don't see anything sensible in it I except see. a fake. I see. You think it's fake? You think Ghana doesn't like its people? <laughs> so where are they coming from? Mm, very well. Uh, Your Excellency, why don't you hold, uh, you know, the connection for me? I want to bring in now uh, security expert Dr. Adam Bona. Uh, let's let's rope him into the conversation. Uh, Doc, good evening to you. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us tonight. But you know the conversation and how it's gone so far, the fact that uh, this research paper is accusing, uh, you know, the government, essentially, the government of, of Ghana of looking away, turning a blind eye to insurgents using this place as a safe haven in exchange of, you know, uh, it, some sort of protection, so to speak. Your thoughts on that? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello? Dr. Bona, I can hear you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, we seem Dr. Bona cannot hear us. We'll fix that connection. In the meantime, uh, let's, let's return to our chat hello. with uh, Ghana's ambassador to Burkina Faso, His Excellency Boniface Agambila. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, so essentially we, we heard yes. today that uh, there had been a high-level meeting uh, around the situation between Ghana and Burkina Faso as far as uh, this insurgent research paper is concerned. Is this a meeting you, you were privy to? That's what you say they say. That's what they say they say will always create problems. No, that's not no, what I said. I'm not aware. I, that's not what I said. I, I'm, I, what I said was that we're hearing reports that there were meetings, <laughs> there were meetings, uh, you know, as a result of this paper that had come to light through uh, the media. Is this a meeting you attended? Is this a meeting you were privy to? No. No. So there was no meeting? If it is a fake meeting, if it was a genuine uh, report, I'm sure uh, I would have heard of it. But no. Maybe people don't want to follow fake things. So. Very well. So. Your Excellency, the last time you spoke to Ghanaian media, you talked about the, uh, is it seven people who had been uh, taken uh, by, uh, you know, insurgents suspected. What's the state of those people who have gone missing? Um, the government are here to give us feedback. Are, are we still looking the for them? The authorities are here to give us feedback. Are we still looking for them? Uh, what, what efforts have we put in place? Yeah, the authorities are on top. The authorities will tell us whatever it is. Mm. Honorable, hold the connection for me. I'm going to bring in uh, Adam Bona. Give it another try. Dr. Adam Bona is a security expert in case you're just joining us. Doc, uh, you, you've heard the conversation really. Uh, this paper, again, I, I'd say, is, a, is accusing the Ghanaian government of looking the other way while insurgents use this place as a safe haven uh, in exchange of protection. What are your thoughts on such an accusation? Oh, yes, uh, good evening, uh, Kemeni, and good evening to your viewers, uh, the, uh, Mr. Agambela on the other side. Well, I, I am surprised that up to now, the national security that is supposed to be holding uh, the, the front, that is supposed to be doing these things for us, probably hasn't spoken. 
because you have a major publication that seems to be scandalizing our you know, national security architecture. And in fact, drawing in inferences with regards to uh, terrorists. And the national security up to now, we haven't had 24 hours, we haven't had any official communication either denying or, you know, confirming, accepting uh, what the publication is attributing to the government of the Republic of Ghana. For me, I find that very worrying. But to speak to it, I mean, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, uh, His Excellency Gambela said. Uh, it, is, it is an open secret that, uh, you know, some of these people might be coming in through unofficial uh, routes. But then the question, as my other colleagues have asked, you know, throughout the day, I have also asked, is why now? Uh, are they sensing that we are going to the polls and therefore they are positioning their, their businesses to be able to, uh, you know, sell uh, military equipment and security equipment to us? Or there is something that they know that we are not aware of. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's an open secret that some of these people might be coming in and uh, our officials might, wouldn't know. It would be difficult for me to accept that uh, they come in with a tacit support of our officials and our officials would have done a deal with them, uh, you know, to come in. I don't want to think so. I mean, I have been uh, actively uh, participating in the Accra initiative activities. And the cry on call has been to see how the coastal states can collaborate in, in you know, fighting this canker within the Sahel that is coming towards us. So I, I, I'm so asking, why has the national security, mm, why I has Kandapar and his people not, do they know something that the rest of us, because I shouldn't be doing the work for Kandapar and his people. I haven't been paid to say government has no knowledge of this. Right. Kandapa but but, but people, look. Kandapa and his people, they are paid to tell us that what these people are saying, because it has to do with our national security. So they can't be, they can't be there unconcerned when the, the country is being dragged down this way and they are quiet because it is their job to do it and it is our job to, be, to probably either put out what we think. But it looks like we are the frontliners and they've taken the back bench, which I, I see. think it doesn't speak well to, to uh, our national security architecture. Come Very in. well. So just a few things from the paper. The paper does not refer to a handshake deal between Ghana and, you know, Jenim. It, what it says is that there appears to be a de facto agreement between the, uh, uh, you know, Ghana looks away, essentially. We know they're here, but we, we look away. Uh, we do not care really that they are here because once they use this place as a safe haven, then would have some, some kind of protection. Is there anything that Ghana could have done in this instance? Well, anything government could have done, whoever, I'm not sure whether the, you know, the, the, the newspaper or the, the news cable that published this, they have a reporter here. If they have a reporter here, I believe Ghana could have summoned the reporter or Ghana could have sanctioned them because obviously they are intruding into our national security space. And therefore, if it is not true, I believe there are remedial measures we can activate. And so as far as I'm concerned, as for a de facto agreement, well, a de facto agreement is an agreement. Obviously, the work of terrorists is illegal. So you cannot sign a deal with terrorists, uh, you know, to let them in while they probably stay away from bombing your territory. So obviously, there can only be one agreement, if indeed there is one, which is the de facto one you refer to. But like I said, the honors is on the national security architecture of the country to let us know, let the whole world know mm. whether there is any informal agreement between the Republic of Ghana and terrorists coming from the Burkina area. I have been around the area. I've, I've driven into the, that side of Burkina through the Hamile border. And, you know, and uh, there is a lot of apprehension. I see. Doug, how, how curious is it also that this paper tells us that it is because of this de facto agreement that 
our border is so lax? Well, I don't think our border is so lax. If you know the architecture, especially towards the northern border, I mean, we are, people are related. I mean, these are relations. It was just an official, you know, uh, line, thin line that was drawn to divide us from, you know, those on the other side. And so if you say, do we build a wall? I mean, so for me, I think that is a non-starter. It's not possible to say our, our you know, border security is lax. Border, we, we, yeah, I mean, I don't think so. I don't think, even though if you ask me, we might not have all it takes, but I have visited some of these border communities. We have substantial improvement with regards to, you know, uh, forwarding posts. The immigration now have, you know, a very important uh, setups there, the military, the police. So we have them along some of these areas. Well, but you are talking about other areas that are not protected. Yes. And so, but I don't want to believe that anybody would want to use that against us. I think that it is our state authorities who are probably sleeping on the job who we should be blaming in this whole conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to check in on, uh, you know, Your Excellency Boniface Agambela. Uh, hopefully he's still here with us. Your Excellency, you spoke about strong yes, I'm border. Here. Indeed. Um, you, strong, you spoke about strong border security earlier. Uh, this paper is telling us that we have intentionally uh, relaxed our border security because of this de facto agreement with the insurgents. I'd have you react to that. But essentially, what do you want the Ghanaian people to do with this information that this paper has released? This, this paper's release, I haven't seen it uh, until bits of it today. But you see, I don't know if you have traveled up to the northern borders, so to know exactly how people live around the borders. And, and we have asked people to be suspicious when they see strangers. See something, say something, okay? If, if the government of Ghana puts an adamant eye to terrorism or has something to do with terrorists, it won't create see something, say something. You remember. Now, you, you see, as my friend Doc has said, when certain things, certain actions come up, you don't rush to make publications. It's good to find out exactly what it is. You don't panic and uh, quickly react to things. Perhaps that allow the government of Ghana, the authorities, to find out be properly before they can say something. So on that court, supposing we are being attacked now, strategically, there will be response. But this is not a true case as such. Somebody says he has done research, and that is his findings. And the research, you know, some of them have their own ideas about research. This research from where? Where did it cover? Nobody is aware. Perhaps someone knows how it was done, but what methodology did they use? How did they approach it? You see? So we cannot be spending our time on somebody's uh, quote-unquote fake research. To say that he has gone to do research. How can a country be putting an eye away and doing so de facto whatever mm -hmm. with, a, a, with people who can attack your people? Okay. F finally, so fi that. finally, before I let you go, uh, Dr. Abona has indicated that we should have heard something from national security uh, by now. I mean, as the... I just Ghanaian... said it, the time is, you allow reasonable time. Allow reasonable time because there are challenges to get... I said, for example, who he mentioned, if they have a reporter in Ghana, but this is a research done by somebody or some group. So it needs time to find out who they are. As I'm talking to, I don't know them. I've never heard of them. Okay? And so all that the government has been doing to protect the people of Ghana, the relationship between Ghana and Burkina, working together, uh, sharing various, communicating with each other, doing training together. Is it not enough to show that even Ghana is apprehensive or fears terrorism? Which country doesn't fear terrorism? 
And which country will want to promote terrorism or support terrorism against another? That mm -hmm. is the point I'm raising. Very well. Uh, yes, and the fact is, I have said it and said it again. The terrorists want to capture the world. And so when they capture Burkina or when Burkina fails, Ghana will be the next place. Uh, indeed. And it's not going to be an individual decision. Very well. Yes, so no see. government, no president of a country will, will uh, think of that. Mm. Your Excellency, I'm afraid we're we out of time. We'll have to end our conversation here. Just yes. a quick word from... Uh, thank you so much for joining us, really. Uh, just a quick word from uh, right. Dr. Adam Bonard. Doc, you heard uh, Your Excellency Agambila, who says that, listen, we should be giving national security a bit more time to look into this research paper before they react. Is that good enough? No, it's not good enough because... in it's a reasonable time to speak. Once you admit that it is fake research, once you admit something is fake, I don't know how, mu how much time you need to be able to formally come out and say it is fake. I am saying that we need an official publication yes. or official release from national security. Mm -hmm. They can come with an interim, you know, release, letting us know that they have, they, they, you know, they, they've seen this report, and to, uh, you know, the best of their knowledge, it's, it's not, uh, it is inaccurate. Well, Meanwhile, it is investigations. But to just leave it that way, I mean, to just leave it that way, mine is that those, those who have listened to it this morning and boarded flights and they are going to probably the other countries would not see what is going on at the moment. Mm. But if the national security had actually counted with their report, that is enough while they continue to do their investigation. So well. I will tell you that, uh, you know, their silence speaks volumes. It's almost like admitting to uh, some of the things we are saying is it's not, it's, it's not do, accurate. Do, Dr. Bonar, quickly, um, you mentioned earlier that you, 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 you don't know if this report is coming ahead of the elections because of weapon sales. Could you elaborate on that point quickly for me, just before we wrap up on this? You know, they, they definitely know that whether you like it or not, there will be a new government in place. And that new government in quotes, uh, you know, obviously Nanado would not continue to be the president of the Republic after the 7th of January. So what they are trying to do is to say that uh, whoever becomes the new president of Ghana, this issue came up before uh, the elections. We want you to invest in military accoutrement, you know, surveillance, security accoutrement and all that. So it's almost like psyching us up and positioning their businesses. I can tell you without any, you know, doubt in my mind that other, you know, businesses from all over the world speak to some of us and say, oh, how do we get involved in your security space moving into 2025? So it's all preparation towards probably seeing how they can influence our security, you know, procurement come 2025 and thereabouts. So it's ground plan. Uh, to get us, uh, you know, do some procurement, buy certain see. things from them, whilst trying to uh, put us in a panic mood. It's not far away from the truth. Very well, Dr. Bona, I appreciate you talking to us. Thank you so much. Uh, Ghana's ambassador to Burkina Faso, uh, His Excellency Boniface Agambila joined us earlier as well. I appreciate your time as well. Uh, thank you so much for jo joining us for this conversation. But also tonight, NPP parliamentary candidate for Zabila constituency, Dr. John Kinsley Krugo, has suspended his campaign and all party activities due to concerns over the Boko crisis and the, its potential impact on the Kusog traditional area. Now, his decision comes on the back of chieftaincy disputes that have sparked tensions among the people. Now, since government's intervention in the dispute, security agencies have been directed to arrest and prosecute anyone claiming to be the Boko Naba to ensure the region's stability. Tonight, the NPP parliamentary candidate has hinted if the security agencies fail to nip the rising tensions in the bud, he will take, excuse me, he will take further steps to protect his life and property in the Kusug traditional area. I want to bring in now our Upper East Region correspondent, Castro Senyala, who's been in the Boko area for two reasons. The first one, on, this, on the situation in Boko at the moment, and then we'll talk about other issues. Uh, Castro, good evening to you. Uh, you we, we know that you are in Boko right now. Talk to us about the atmosphere there.
Castro, we cannot hear you. You'd have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. What's the situation in Boko can, this can, evening? Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I'm asking what the situation yes, in yes. Boko is like right now. Yes, Kamini, the situation in Boko uh, at the moment is very calm. Boko is very calm and serene. As you see behind me, everything is moving on so well. Uh, except that uh, earlier in the day, um, unlike how Boko is always known to be, very brisk in terms of business and very lively early in the afternoon. It was very quiet with few people going about their activities also. Um, portions of the township had shops closed, uh, which is, I mean, which is very, very unlikely of the biggest, one of the biggest municipalities in the Upper East region. Mm, I see. We know that it wouldn't only be the NPP parliamentary candidate who suspended his campaign. You were there with the NDC's running mate, Professor Nana Jenepokwajiman, who's also suspended certain activities in the community. Let's talk about why these have become necessary. Right. So uh, yesterday, the running mate of the NDC entered the region to begin her two-day campaign uh, tour of uh, uh, in some areas within the region. Uh, this morning, her first port of call was the Boko area. But uh, going into the day, uh, there was almost a call off of the campaign activities due to uh, some incidents that happened yesterday that have sort of threatened the security of the Boko township. Uh, yesterday, there were gunshots throughout the night. And so this morning, when she, I uh, mean, prepared to go, it appeared that her team was very hesitant. Uh, but she finally went there, where, went to Boko, where she first of all called on the Boko Naba, and there she expressed concerns over the insecurity situation in the uh, town and asked that uh, state actors and that of the traditional authority should, I mean, closely collaborate to be able to bring the Boko dispute to a, a closure. And now, uh, she also had to do some other activities within the town. You know, she likes to meet women folk in the town, market women. And uh, that was something that was very important and key to her campaign uh, trip. But then because of the, I mean, the volatile nature, the tensed up atmosphere in Boko, uh, she was not able to meet uh, these market women and other groups within mm. the, 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 the township. Yes. So um, she had to eventually call off the, uh, the campaign activity in the Boko area. I see. After almost um, an hour, I mean, just an hour after well. meeting the... But he had to move back. She had to move back. I beg your pardon to uh, Bogatanga. Kasha, once again, I'm out of time, but I'm grateful that you stayed up to talk to us here on Ghana Tonight. If you just joined us, this is Ghana Tonight. I'm Kemeni Amano. When we come back, I'll tell you why Ghanaians think that certain key state institutions like the Electoral Commission and the Ghana Police Service are corrupt. Don't go away. Welcome back. And you may want to stop for this one. The police service... The presidency, tax officials, by that I guess is the GRA, members of parliament and judges as well as magistrates are perceived as the most corrupt in the latest Afrobarometer report. Now, despite uh, having lost some trustworthiness among the over 2,400 respondents surveyed, the Ghana Armed Forces, religious leaders, traditional leaders and non-governmental organizations remain trustworthy. Now let's take a look at some of the details th that come with this report. Well, we'll show you that shortly, but we also know that the CDD's director of research has been speaking more on this report. Let's take a listen. I'll show you some aspects of that. I I'll show you some aspects um, of that report. Oh, my understanding is we will not be bringing you that yeah, you know, it's a bit confusing right now. But how about we have a conversation with Mavis Zupok Dome, who is Senior Research Analyst at Afrobarometer uh, Ghana National Investigator with the CDD Ghana. She's joined us via telephone. Uh, good evening to you, Mavis. Good evening, and good evening to your listeners. Indeed, just to put my question into perspective, I want our viewers to take a look at some aspects of the Afrobarometer report. Let's put that up right now. We know that between the period 2012 to 2024, 12-year 12 period, members in parliament, the trustworthiness has dropped for members of parliament from 49% to 
to 24%. A net difference of 24. You go on to position political party, you see the same net of 27. You go down to the electoral commission from 59, 59% trustworthiness. In 2012, we go down to 28%, almost halving it, uh, with a minus 30 uh, difference in the trustworthiness as far as the Ghanaian people are concerned. But look at the Ghana Armed Forces. Although it has 65% as of 2024, you can see that it has also dropped marginally from 2012 when it had a 72% trustworthiness among respondents' survey, essentially reflective of the Ghanaian people. Let's come back to Mavis now. Uh, Mavis, let's talk about this latest report and how you collected it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this latest report is from Ghana Afrobarometer Round 10 survey, which was uh, data was collected in August this year. Um, Afrobarometer is 25 years now. Uh, we have collected um, data from close to 42 countries right now across Africa. That includes Ghana. CDD um, is a partner for for Afrobarometer since the beginning of Afrobarometer. And Afrobarometer is a, a Pan-African non-partisan survey network. Mm. So basically, for every country, and that includes Ghana, a nationally representative sample of adult population is used to draw um, for I the see. survey. And that is um, 18 years and above. Mm. Um, Interesting. Interviews are conducted face to face. Um, interviews are conducted. It's a standardized questionnaire that is asked over time and across the country to allow. And, and, and I want to look. I want to look at that questionnaire, Mavis, real quick, just before we wrap up our program. When you look at the question on trustworthiness, if you could put that up, you see that the respondents were asked, "How much do you trust each of the following?" Or, "Haven't you heard enough about them to say?" Why is the yes. question double barrel? They would appear it does not target only the issue of trustworthiness. Well, the question is not so so much of a double barrel one. Um, you want to allow the respondent to, to answer the question um, only when the, uh, the respondent has enough to say. So you, 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 you allow the respondent um, that uh, option. Because if the respondent do not have enough to say about the institution, then the respondent would would would, would say that I don't have enough about uh, I don't know enough about this institution to say whether I trust the institution or not. Our 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 survey a respondent uh, is at will to decline answering a question or the whole survey. No respondent is forced. Mm, By every adult uh, population has an equal chance. Uh, of being interviewed because we use nationally representative um, well. sample and, and uh, proportion to the pop, uh, pop, proportion to the population of a region. So, Indeed, yeah. Mavis, I'm afraid we'd have to end it here. But again, That's thank you so much for staying up to talk to us. Uh, Mavis Zapok Dome is with uh, CDD Ghana. She's part of the team that came up with this, the latest Afrobarometer uh, report. We've been looking at the collection process in order to determine the accuracy of this uh, report. She's explained to us as best as uh, she can. I have a feeling we'll pick this up again because there's a lot more in this report that we need to look at as far as people's perception of corruption in this country is concerned. But unfortunately, we'll have to bring our show to a close today. I am always thrilled to come your way. But then I also feel very unhappy when I have to go. And just when I had to go, I'm told that there's breaking news. Um, I see. Very well. Uh, it would appear that Ghana has scored one on the world stage, thanks to our foreign affairs minister, Shelley Ayoko Boche, who has now been... Uh, elected the Commonwealth Secretary, uh, Secretary General, I understand. So Shelly Ayokobote won the election, and she's now the Commonwealth Secretary General, scoring one for Ghana on the world stage. Uh, hopefully it's reflected home as well. Don't tell anybody I said that. I'll see you same time on Friday. I'm Kameni Amano. Remember that Alfred Ocancio will be here with his guests at 7 a.m. tomorrow for Key Points. And I will see you 2 p.m. on Sunday with my very exclusive interview with Oliver Baka-Vomawa. Explosive interview. You don't want to miss it. Good night.